Before we were born. Before we took our first breath. Before the week started. Before the year started. Before we said, I love you. Before we said, I'm sorry. Before we figured out who we really are. Before we figured out who we want to be. Before it all. God loved us. Unconditionally and freely. Fully and honestly. God loved us. Again and again, this is where our story begins. Let us worship God. Good morning. We are so glad that you've chosen to join us this morning for worship. We hope you feel welcomed and encouraged as a part of the Hominy family. As we prepare to join together in a prayer of confession, I'd like to invite you to watch this video with us. There's a lot that the kids need to know. A letter to a person on their first day here. Today, over 360,000 babies will be born, and you are one of them. Welcome, this is the world. It's a pretty cool place. There's lots to see, smell, there's corn dogs. Ah, I'm getting ahead of myself. There's just so much to do. Singing, and dancing, oh, and laughing. <laughs> Laughing's the best. It's especially great when, when you laugh, milk comes out of your nose. But only if you just had milk. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just gross. Some days, gross things will happen. Some days, awesome things will happen. Some days, you'll get ice cream. And some days, you won't. Some days, your kite will fly high. Some days, it gets stuck in the tree. It's just how it is here. There's plenty of reasons to dance. You just got to look for them. Don't worry though, you won't be doing this alone. You're going to meet lots of people here. Some of them will be really nice and some won't be. It's not that they can't be, it's just maybe they're just having a bad day. Being a person is hard sometimes. You should give people high fives just for getting out of bed. Oh, high fives, I forgot to explain that. How do I explain this? Um, it's kind of, high fives are like hitting someone who is your friend. Uh, that's really bad. Just treat everybody like it's their birthday, even if they don't deserve it. Because we all mess up sometimes. The biggest mess up, not forgiving each other's mess ups. Maybe you'll be a teacher. Maybe you'll be president. Maybe you'll cure every disease ever. You might even see the Grand Canyon, swim in the ocean. Oh, this is so, so much. Uh, it's a lot. Um, try this. Take a breath. Isn't that amazing? It's called breathing. You're going to do it a lot, but nobody knows exactly how much. So enjoy it. Pay attention. Take brain pictures. Because amazing things will happen every day. You're going to do so much. But it's not about what you do, it's about who you are. And you, you're awesome. You're made that way. You're made from love, to be love, to spread love. And love is always louder, no matter what. Even if hate has a bullhorn, love is louder. So let your life be loud. Let's shout to the world. Things can be better. It's okay about all the mess ups. Corn dog drool. Sorry, I'm just keep bringing that up. I don't think I told you this yet. We're really glad you're here. We don't say that enough to each other here because, well, life gets busy. You're going to be important, and you're going to do a lot, and you're going to smell great, but don't get too busy. Remember to let everybody know you're glad they're here. You don't have to remember all this right now. You're going to need a pep talk sometimes, and that's okay. For now, remember this. You're awake. You're awesome. Live like it. We were made from love, to be love, to give love. That's just another way of saying God loved first. Our story, the story, starts with love. So join me in a prayer of confession and as we strive to commit this truth to memory. Let's pray. God of love, we forget the beginning of the story. That we were made from love, to be love, to give love. Instead of rooting our story in the goodness refrain of creation, we skip ahead and find our worth at the fall with Cain and Abel lost in the wilderness. We forget that first there was you and you are love. We forget that out of that love you created us. We forget that from the very first day you loved first. We forget 
because a love like that doesn't make sense to us. Forgive our low self-esteem. Forgive our resistance to love ourselves. Forgive our hesitation to trust that even we could be made good. And forgive our tendency to pass that doubt on from generation to generation. Write a new beginning for us that roots our confidence in your unrelenting love. With hope we pray again and again. Amen. As we prepare for our time of prayer, you will, be, you will have been praying for Melissa as she has undergone surgery this past week and, and hope you'll be praying for her as she recovers. We're also praying for Mary Hudgens who is anticipating surgery March 26th. We also are praying, continue to pray for Melissa's family, her extended family. Uh, her mother, Ellen Widener's cousin, Inga Griffith, has been uh, admitted to hospice for care at the end of her life. So we continue to pray for that entire family as they go through so much these days. Will you join me now in a time of silent prayer? Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast on Lord God, it is a privilege to bring before you those we love so deeply. For we know that when we bring them before you, we can trust you to do what you have always done. To heal, to put together that which is broken, to comfort, to carry. So we pray for those who are hurting today, whose bodies have betrayed them and are not doing the things that they want them to do anymore and they need healing. We pray for those who are deeply missing someone they love, someone who was always there. We pray for them to know that you are holding them through these days. Lord, for those who are faced with responsibilities that are beyond their capacities, Lord, we just pray to let, that they would know that you are enough and you will give them what they need to do what you call them to do. Lord, for our community and for our nation, we pray for wisdom and courage and humility Help our leaders and all of us make decisions that are best for your children. All this we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Family of faith, no matter what we do, where we go, or what we tell ourselves, God is love and God is loving us. Again and again, we are claimed, held, forgiven, and cared for. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Did you know that one of your very first words was the word no? Now, that doesn't surprise a lot of us. We, we know we say the word no very early in life. It's, 
But the other thing that's very interesting that I learned this week, one of the first words that a baby understands is no. The other one is food. They understand what that means. But at about nine months of age, a baby begins to understand the word no. I find that interesting. Well, it's because they hear it a lot. No, don't get into that. No, stop that. No, don't do that. No, 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 no. We hear it a lot at an early age. And actually, we continue to hear it a lot throughout our childhood. I found, um, was recommended this cute little book called No, David, that I want to read to you and share with you right now. No, David, written by David Shannon and published by the Blue Sky Press. David's mom always said, No, David! No, David, no. No, no, no. Come back here, David. David, be quiet. Don't play with your food. That's enough, David. Go to your room. Settle down. Stop that this instant. Put your toys away. Not in the house, David. <sighs> I said no, David. Davy, come here. Yes, David, I love you. The end. So David learned very early the word no also. It's interesting, the author of this book wrote this when he was a young child. And he drew the pictures and he gave it to his mom and there were only two words he knew how to spell, no and David. And so he wrote this book. It was later in his adulthood that he re-released it, rewrote it a little bit and added the last part. I don't think we understand fully until we have someone who, after so long of telling us no, finally embraces us and says, yes, I do love you. No matter what, I do love you. You know, sometimes it feels like God tells us no a lot, just like our mom and dad tells us no a lot. God says, no, no lying, no stealing, no, doing all these things. He's written it out in his Bible, in his word. And he tells us no a lot. But do you know why God tells us no and why our parents tell us no? It's because they love us so much that they want the best life for us. And they want us to be the best person we can be. And sometimes that means not doing the things we really, really, really want to do. So remember that when your parents tell you no, or when God tells you no, it's coming from a place of complete and utter love. Just like the mom in the story. It's coming from a place of love. And she calls him Davy Because that's her beloved term for him, her beloved name. And God does that same thing. He welcomes you into his arms calls you his beloved, and said, yes, I do love you no matter what. Let's pray. 
God, we are so very thankful that even when we disobey and even when we don't do what we're supposed to do and you have to tell us no, no, no and our parents and people around us have to say no, stop, don't do that. That you still welcome us with open arms into your love because you created us with love, you created us to be love and you created us from love. And for that, we are so very grateful. Thank you for loving us. Help us to love others in the same way. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. See me through a lens of perfect love And no mistake could change your mind You see my brokenness, there's no disguise But there is mercy in your eyes Unconditional child who needs your grace You run to me
you join me in a time of prayer? God of the here and now, we have heard the words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Time and time again we've heard these words. We have read them on billboards, heard them in worship, and seen them on signs. And yet, we know there is a difference in hearing those words and in deeply listening to those words. We long to listen, God. We long to hear your truth. We long to know your love. Open our hearts and our minds. We are listening. Amen. Our gospel lesson comes from the book of John, chapter 3. As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the desert, in the same way the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to be its judge, but to be its savior. Those who believe in the son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show what they did was in obedience to God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Our psalm this morning comes from Psalm 107, verses 1 through 3 and 17 through 22. Shout praises to the Lord. God is good to us, and God's love never fails. Everyone the Lord has rescued from trouble should praise God. Everyone God has brought from the east and the west the north and the south. Some of you had foolishly committed a lot of sins and were in terrible pain. The very thought of food was disgusting to you, and you were almost dead. You were in serious trouble, but you prayed to the Lord, and God rescued you. By the power of God's own word, God healed you and saved you from destruction. You should praise the Lord for his love and for the wonderful things God does for all of us. You should celebrate by offering sacrifices and singing joyful songs to tell what God has done. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church family. Would you pray with me, please? Holy, loving God, I once was a young man. Most often within, I still feel that way, but I look in the mirror and I see otherwise. Things that I did with ease now take work. Things that I did without considering now can cause my back to hurt. But there are great privileges, O oh God, that come along with wisdom that is best found in those who have lived long enough to learn. Teach us this morning to consider the story of Nicodemus, an old man who had a lot to learn. 
and he did. We're thankful for him. And we're thankful for his Savior, who is ours. In Christ, amen. 2,000 years ago, Nicodemus was a very widely respected and wise man. A member of Israel's ruling court, the Sanhedrin. Uh, he was constantly trying to press the edges, I suspect, figure things out beyond the obvious. When the court was moving like a locomotive toward a decision, I suspect it was often that Nicodemus would say, well, wait just a minute, have we considered this. Nicodemus was trying to figure out just who Jesus is. Now most of the Sanhedrin had already made up their mind. They were very clear in their thinking. Jesus is a rabble rouser. He's a malcontent who's determined to bring the wrath of the Roman government down upon the Hebrew people because of his behavior. I make no joke when I suggest that as I read about the ancient Sanhedrin, I am reminded of our Congress today in our own nation. There were loads of bickering, angry, opinionated, egotistical people who were unwilling to be moved by new thinking. But there were within them a tiny few, a tiny few who genuinely loved God and wanted to make sure they did what was best for Israel. Nicodemus was that kind of man. He was always in the tiny minority. One night he makes a visit to our Savior, Jesus. He's determined to find out if Jesus just might be the Messiah the Israelites had been searching for for centuries. Now Nicodemus already knew that Jesus was not like those other false messiahs that had been walking through the hillsides for years. He knew that there was something of God anointing Jesus. He knew that those others were more like barking dogs. So, Nicodemus and Jesus are sitting in the dark, so to speak, it is out of that that Jesus says to Nicodemus something so powerful. Jesus says, those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. You see, darkness always would flee from Jesus. Why? Well, darkness can't stand light. Darkness provides cover. If, if you're a thief, you love darkness. That's when most of the break-ins occur. If you're a kid and you leave your bicycle in your front yard one afternoon while you go in to get a drink of water, chances are your bike will be there when you get back. But if you leave your bike outside overnight, it may not be there the next morning. People with ill intent love the darkness. Jesus knew the Jewish leaders were preparing to arrest him, to accuse him of blasphemy against the Hebrew faith. Jesus was making sure that this one leader, Nicodemus, who was coming seeking light, would have the light shared exposed so that he could choose or choose not to bathe himself in it. Now it's important here to take note of something our modern tendencies don't really consider often. When we hear about Jesus today, we think that his presence 2,000 years ago must have been an overwhelming presence. If you got near Jesus, you knew right away, this man's from God. I'm not so sure had I bumped into Jesus 2,000 years ago, I would have done any better than the other people around him. Most people did not recognize Jesus for who he is. Most did not believe that God Almighty had anointed him for this work. 
I suspect if he came back today, the vast majority of us, even in the church, might not recognize him, at least not at first. It is into this third chapter of John, which for many of you hearing my voice is your favorite chapter in all the scripture, that we have the bedrock of our Christian faith given to us. The basic tenets of who we are as Christians and what it is we are to be about and why it is we became are found in the third chapter of John. When it was first shared 2,000 years ago, to a tiny band of people today on the earth, almost not quite four billion people on our planet in some fashion or another claim that Jesus Christ is the Savior. In John 3, verse 16, we know that verse. We're taught that verse so very early on. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that if we would believe in him, we wouldn't perish, we wouldn't die, but we would have life, which is everlasting. Don't you love that verse? And it's so filled with power and promise. But you know John three seventeen, the next verse, is just as powerful. For God sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Powerful tenets, places for us to latch and hold on to as we move through this life, which is filled with so much difficulty. God made a way for us to be found. And I've never met a person who didn't want to be found. On the cross of Jesus, divine love was activated. The God we know in Jesus is unlike all of those other gods, the false gods that were before Jesus was upon the earth during that time, and all of the false gods since that time, including the false gods we worship today. The false god of materialism. Oh, if I can just have a little bit more of that stuff, I'll be happy. If I provide this to my child, my child will be happy. Oh, if I give my spouse this, th that will satisfy them. And we find out that God simply never meets the expectation. In our nation right now, I think we're struggling against the God of nationalism. I think we are struggling against the idea that uh, to be... A good Christian, you have to also be a good American who is going to lift up the flag high and hold tight to what certain political persuasions say. And I say, absolutely not. The only flag that we need to bow before is the flag of Christ. Yes, be a good citizen. Yes, do your duty as a citizen. Yes, defend your nation. Yes, pay your taxes. Yes, obey the laws of your land. For you are to render to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar. But when it comes to your allegiance, ultimately, there is only one place it can be. And that is in Christ Jesus. We've all heard so much about the growth of Islam around the world, and for many, uh, that's a troubling thing. And we, we wonder, you know, are, are they going to overrun and overrule? Here's what I know, truth will win because truth ultimately always does. And the truth of Jesus Christ is the most of all ultimate truths, and it will win. Did you know that in the holy book of Islam, the Quran, not one time throughout the entire book, throughout the entire Quran, is love a, given as an attribute of Allah. Not one time. But in our holy book, God is called not only a God who loves us and a God of love, God is called love, for God is love. There it is. When it comes to God, 
Our God takes us very personally. He pays attention to us. And for some of us, that causes us to tremble because we think, well, he's got a scorecard up there, and when I mess up, there's an X there, and when I do well, he puts the big check, and I've been looking, and I've got a lot more X's than I do checks. I don't think that's how it works with God. I think God loves us so much that no matter what the score of X's or checks, he loves us more than all of that. While we were yet sinners, Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, Christ died for us. And we know that and we trust that. Divine love was activated on the cross of Jesus Christ. Why was Jesus on the cross? Was it because he was weak? No, it was because of his ultimate strength that he laid it down. And he who had no sin became sin on our behalf. That's what God thinks of you. A pastor tells the story of the time his 28-year-old son was going into surgery. A very ser serious surgery, open heart and open chest and down through the abdomen. He was going to have, among other things, an aortic transplant, big-time surgery. This loving pastor father was there at his bedside on the morning of the surgery and had stayed with him through all of that. And it's almost time for him to leave the room and go to the surgical suite. And as they come for him, this pastor who loved his boy puts his arm around him, reaches and brings him up to his chest. And he holds him and with a tearful voice, he says, Oh, Wes, I so wish I could go through this for you. Wes, not losing the opportunity of breaking the tension, said, boy, Dad, I sure wish you would. But you know, that's exactly what Christ has done for us. I deserve no one to pay my price. I dug the hole. I ought to have to lie in it. But the scripture says that Jesus did for us what fairness would demand we do for ourselves. He paid not just, listen, not just the price of our sin. He paid our price. Jesus paid for the things that I should have done and didn't, the things that I've done that I shouldn't have. Jesus knows them and he's paid the price. Why? Because Jesus loves his family and he considers you family. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. How can we say such a thing? Well, you see, we come to understand that our God, because He is love, our God who is loving, teaches us that death is a shadow and shadows don't hurt us. We fear no evil, for in Christ we have come to know Victory is already ours, not because of what we've done, but because of what Christ has accomplished. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul writes a virtual treatise, if you will, on immortality. He talks about seeds being planted in the earth and dying there, but then a sprout bursting forth from them and bringing the promise of new life. Paul says, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then your faith is absolutely futile and your sins are endless. Did you hear that? If Christ has not been raised from the dead, we're hopeless. He goes on to say, we should be pitied more than all people, but in Christ, death has lost its sting. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Hallelujah. So why hasn't the world come running to Christ if God has done all of that for us? If he has cared for us this way, if he's provided the way for us, if Christ has loved us in spite of ourselves, why hasn't the whole world responded to that message? Well, the first part of it is the most obvious, and that is a good part of the world has not heard that message. You heard me a moment ago say that almost 4 billion people 
in this world claim some kinship to Christian faith. What I didn't say is over 4 billion people on this earth have no confidence in Christian faith, either because they've heard it and reject it or because they've simply never heard. So that's the first reason people don't come flocking to his feet. But the second reason is too many of us have convinced ourselves that our sin outweighs God's love, that our failures are too great for even God. It's really the sin of the Sanhedrin when you think about it. They didn't come running to Jesus because they had convinced themselves the only way they've got a shot at pleasing God was to follow rigid rules of religion. And Jesus wasn't buying that. And he certainly wasn't selling it. I read a great story about Peck Hickman. Now, I didn't know that name until I read this story, but if you are a University of Louisville fan, then you know the name Peck Hickman. He's really the one who took the athletic department at University of Louisville and moved it to the level of play they now operate on. An amazing director of athletics there. His pastor was also his dear, dear friend. And year after year, uh, Peck Hickman would say to his pastor, um, uh, Olds, what was his first name? I don't recall, Harold maybe, Olds? But Pastor Olds, he would say to him, I want you to come with your whole family and let me give you a night at the basketball game. It'll be wonderful. And, and Pastor Olds did what, gosh, most pastors I know do. We convince ourselves that we're just too busy. We've got too many demands on us. We can't do that. Uh, look at all the things we need to be doing. And, and we convince ourselves sadly and dishonestly that we are somehow indispensable. Year after year, Pastor Olds said that. Year after year, the invitation kept coming back. Finally, Peck Hickman offered again, let me invite you and your family. Come and be with us. For... And, and Pastor Olds had enough. He said, okay, we'll do it. When is it? And they arranged the time. And then he said, listen, I'm, I'm going to ma uh, make it so that this is painless for you. I'm going to have somebody come pick you up. Well, the night of the game, or actually that late afternoon, sure enough, a long limousine pulled up in front of the pastor's home. And, and a knock came to the door, and the family goes out, and they get in this wonderful automobile. And they are driven there to the basketball stadium. It's, it's an amazing trip. When they get there, the gate opens, and lo and behold, they are pushed through. All the other people stood to the side while this car went in. They get out of the car, are taken to an elevator. They go up into the suites above that basketball arena. When they go inside, the, the smells of food had already permeated out into the hallway. And they were seated at a wonderful table with a very few other people. And they enjoyed, they dined on scrumptious foods. After a while, they were taken to the front. And there were these glass panels. And they could look down into the arena. It was a perfect spot to be. Nobody in the whole arena had a better shot of the game than they. They enjoyed snacks while the game was going on. And about uh, halfway through the second half, Pastor Old's daughter looked up at her daddy from the mouth of babes. She said, Daddy, why haven't we been doing this all along? I believe, it's too subjective to prove, I believe that a reason so many people have decided to not decide about Jesus is because they just can't imagine that it's real, that it's glorious, and that they've been invited. One of my favorite movies of all time, Saving Private Ryan, Tom Hanks. I just love him as an actor. 
In that movie, a band of American soldiers who just landed at Normandy Beach and been through all of the destruction and death of that invasion. Uh, they are then rounded up together at the top of the hill that they've now secured. And they are told that they have a mission, a very specific mission. There is a, a young man out there named James Ryan, Private James Ryan. And they are, to have, uh, they are to go and find him. Now, the troops that he landed with, their, their parachutes uh, took them to places that they really weren't supposed to be. The landing for them the night before was not a strong landing. They're not even sure he's alive, but if he is, they don't know where he is. But you and your men are to go, and you are to find Private James Ryan. Well, Tom Hanks, being the captain of this crew, he says, uh, may I ask why? And he said, yes. It turns out that James Ryan was the fifth of five sons and that his older four brothers had all enlisted in the United States Army just as he had and that all four of them had already met their demise. They were gone. And if the Army could intervene in time, they were going to withdraw him so that this mother and father did not lose their last child. With that, uh, the captain took his crew and they went searching through it. It's an amazing movie. So many variegated stories coming out of that. When they hadn't found him well into the script, one of the soldiers looks at Tom Hanks, the captain, and, and he says this, Why on earth? Are we risking our lives for whoever this Private Ryan is? He's probably not worth it anyway. When I look at my life, I'm not worth it. What God is up to, what God is capable of, God could do with his eyes shut without my support. I'm not worth it. But that's not how God sees it. Jesus, why is God doing all God is doing? Sending you in my place. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God made a way for all of us, for any of us to have eternal life. Why? Well, it turns out we're worth it. We are worth it, at least to God. So long ago, this night visitor named Nicodemus discovers what is required to be a follower of Jesus. Jesus looks at him square in the eye, and this old man there attentive to everything Jesus is saying, and Jesus says, you want to belong to me? You must be born again. Now Nicodemus heard with his physical ears, not quite yet his spiritual ears. And Nicodemus did what I think I would have done. What? I must be born again. I'm an old man. How can I re-enter my mother's womb, he asked. And Jesus reminded him, oh, there is physical birth of water. But I speak of the birth of spirit. And I say to you, you must be born again. Now I'd love to tell you that Nicodemus fell on his knees right there and, and said, Lord, I'll, I'll believe everything you say to me and I'll do everything to the best of my ability I can. I'd love to tell you that's located in the scripture. It is not. But I do believe that Nicodemus, this thinking, open-minded Hebrew man, 
did make peace with Jesus. I do believe on that great day when we stand before God, we will meet Nicodemus. Why do I believe? Because we discover Nicodemus scattered throughout the remaining days of Jesus' ministry. He never gave up on Jesus. Jesus has never given up on you. Well, Joe, you know, if Jesus knew what I did, folks, he knows. He knows what you did. If Jesus knew that I have these thoughts, he knows. You see, Jesus doesn't love you because of anything. He just loves you. Don't complicate it. Receive that love because you will never be able to give more love than you receive. Receive the love that God has for you so that you can give that love to others. No greater love hath a man than this but that he would lay down his life for his friends. What is the best way to show you love that you love God? That you serve one another. We have to give up on ourselves. How can I, an old man, be born again? What Jesus is really saying is this. We have to give up. We have to give up on our ultimate hope before Jesus, which is ourselves. I suspect that the entire world who has heard the Jesus story. Much of the world hasn't. But the entire world that's heard the Jesus story, I suspect they pull for that story. They like that story. Jesus, yeah, he was a good guy. He said some important things. He did some great things. Yay, Jesus. But then they hunker down back into their own strength, their own power, what it is they themselves can accomplish. And the end result of it? They've heard the truth, but it's not set them free. How can someone like me, like you, be born again? By giving up on ourselves. As Luke 9, 23 would say it, Jesus said, If you wish to come and follow me, you must deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Deny yourself means give up on you as you take up following Jesus. Then you'll have life. It'll be abundant here. It'll be eternal and overflowing with God. Tonight when you go to bed, Think on these things. And if the Spirit so leads, put up the white flag of surrender and say, I do surrender all because I've tried and tried on my own strength and I keep coming up empty. Let's pray. I praise you, God, that what worked 2,000 years ago works now, and it will work 2,000, 10,000, 100,000 years from now. That the more we diminish and make room for you, the more life we discover. May it be so in us now. Through Jesus our Savior. Amen. In a moment you're going to have an opportunity to think further on this. But first hear these words. This consideration of taking where we are in this time of worship just a bit deeper. To the glory of God. Amen. If you hold a newborn in your arms, all at once you will understand the crook of your elbow and the cup of your palm as never before. Ordinary curves of the body transformed into a resting space. 
You were designed for love. And if you're lucky enough to hold a newborn in your arms, and that newborn curls its tiny fingers around yours, making your hands look like the hands of a giant, then time might stand still, and those around you might point and say, Look, that little one is holding on. And in that moment, if you pay attention, you will catch a glimpse of the circle that love was meant to be. God is love, our resting place. With small hands, we also hold on. We believe God is love, unconditional, constant love. We believe this love exists for all, choosing each and every one of us, day after day, again and again and again. We believe that God's love is like a river. Rivers cannot help but flow towards the sea. God's love cannot help but move towards us. We are swimming in it. We believe that God loved first. We believe that God breathed life into dust. We believe that God said this is good. And because we believe that God loved first, we strive to build lives that reflect God's love. 
May we begin again here. Amen. We are so glad that you've joined us for worship this morning. We hope uh, you have been touched and heard the word of Jesus this morning. If you would like to share about where you are in your faith journey or you want some, some help and conversation about that, please get in touch with us. Go to our website and go to uh, connect and contact us. Leave us a message there. Call the church, leave a message there, and we'll be glad to get in touch with you to help you know more about following Christ. As we leave this place this morning, I want to let you know about a few things happening. Hopefully by now you have already moved your clock forward. If you haven't, this will probably be a good time to do that. But this Wednesday, uh, March 17th at 6.30, will be our St. Patrick's Day Family Game Night. If you have not done that with us on Zoom, it is a lot of fun. Uh, you can see the uh, Zoom ID and password there. Uh, join us at 6.30 this Wednesday night for uh, our family game night, and, and you'll see just how much fun that is. Uh, you don't have to do anything. You can just watch some of the people play, and, and you'll, you'll get a kick out of that. A week later, on March 24th, we'll be offering Scam, Protect, Scam Protection 101. Uh, our own Mike Sexton from the Buncombe County Sheriff's Department will be leading us in a workshop on Zoom, and you'll see more information about that in your bulletin, in your newsletter, how to get on that. Great information for people of all ages, not just our elderly folks, but all of us are susceptible to scams these days. So look forward to having you participate in that on March 24th. This is also the week that you should have turned in your nominations for deacons. Uh, if you haven't done so, please do that uh, today. So that can get to the deacons. You can contact Earl Shelton with those names today. So we close our service. Will you join me in hearing this benediction? As you leave, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk toward justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day in the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself. Go with courage. Go with heart. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.